Good morning. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Human Progress and Flourishing Workshop. In this series, we bring in scholars from across the country to present their research and engage in a discussion with the NDSU community. Topics focus on innovation, opportunity, and ways to increase individual and societal flourishing. And I'm really excited that today we're joined by Dr. Chris Blattman. I'm not excited by the fact that it's virtual. He had, unfortunately, an ankle injury, um, had ankle surgery, and that's why he's here virtually. But he's promised to come here next year, and I'm excited about that as well. But it's still going to be a super exciting uh, presentation today. Dr. Chris Blattman is the Romilly E. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago in the Harris School of Public Policy and the Pearson Institute. He also co-leads the university's Development Economic Center and the International Policy and Development Program at the Harris School. Dr. Blattman is an economist and political scientist who studies global conflict, crime, and poverty. He works in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the United States, asking questions like, why are some people in societies violent, oppressive, and poor? Most of his current research is with armed groups, gangs, organized crime, and the people who join violent organizations. This work involves a blend of qualitative interviews, large-scale surveys, statistical analysis, and field experiments. He also aims to bring, bring big ideas and research to a general audience, which is why he wrote the book, Why We Fight, The Roots of War and the Paths to Peace. And that's what he's gonna be presenting on today. And you all got a copy of the book. And so really excited uh, to welcome Dr. Chris Blattman here today. And so could everyone, after he's, he's gonna present for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time for questions at, after that. Um, and so would everyone please welcome Dr. Chris Blattman. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm really regretful not to be able to Join you all in person today, and I do look forward to coming sometime in the next in the next year. But unfortunately, this uh, I don't know if you can see this crutch and uh, is is my uh, and and a ban from flying for two months is my current predicament. Uh, I'm going to share some slides with you here. So, you know, look, I like to start off this presentation by by saying that this is actually not really a book about my ideas. This is a book born of frustration. This is a book born of the fact that for the last 20 years of my career, I've been learning things, learning things from every social science, learning some of the hard-won lessons from these uh, practitioner and, and practical statesmen and women that I've, I've met, uh, ideas that rotated my brain 90 degrees and then 90 degrees again and 90 degrees again and kind of sent, sent me spinning. And um, and some of them are decades old, and and they really are not out there in the public discussion. And so I, you know, try to talk about it through some of my own experiences and and the conflicts that I've seen. But 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 this is really a book about you know all of social science and all these practical experiences rolled up in, into one. And I can't tell you all of that in a in a single session. So I just want to focus on five big ideas. Uh, I think the five most important ideas that probably will change the way you, you think about war, because they certainly changed how I think about war. And, and the first one of those is actually, most of the time we don't fight. Or as I like to say, enemies prefer to loathe one another in peace. And this is really easy to forget. It's easy to forget at a moment when it feels like we might be on the, word, the verge of, of World War III with Russia. It's easy to forget when we see uh you know tensions rising falling rising falling between the united states and taiwan and china uh when, at a time when civil wars have reached their peak uh since the 1980s uh but it's true then the problem is, is we just don't pay attention to a lot of the times we don't fight right we 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 open the newspaper and we see story after story after story of conflicts that are happening all right and very rarely do we see uh, stories about the ones that don't? Uh, and, and occasionally, though, you'll stumble upon one by accident, as I did uh, just a couple of weeks into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when India launched a cruise missile by accident at Pakistan, and nothing happened. Uh, I stumbled upon this accidentally only after scrolling through about 
20 pages of Ukraine news on my phone. But that day, like most days for the past few decades, India and Pakistan, these age-old enemies, did not go to war, right? And this is happening all the time. And sometimes, in some sense, peace is breaking out every day between rivals who loathe one another. And, and the fact that we don't pay attention to this makes us a little bit like emergency room doctors who have forgotten that the natural state of human health is health. Uh, then, and fortunately, our medical profession doesn't make this mistake, right? Doctors and medical researchers are constantly comparing the sick to the healthy. They're constantly focused on, on what makes people healthy, what went wrong. And, and we make medical advances precisely because we're, we're, we're focused not just on the critically ill, but on those who are moving towards health or those who never get ill in the first place. And if you don't do that, right, if you make this mistake of focusing only on the times peace failed, then there's two bad consequences. The first is that you get depressed and demoralized, right? Just as you would if you're an emergency doctor who forgot that the natural state of humanity is health. And the second issue, though, is more important, is that you basically diagnose the causes of, of conflict all wrong, right? You'd basically just be rotten at diagnosis and therefore you'd be rotten at treatment. Because what you do is you take the conflicts that happen and you trace back to preceding events and you'd see ancient hatreds and poverty and all sorts of issue after issue after issue, an assassination of an archduke, some sort of leader's foibles. Um, but the problem is, is if, if you went to all the conflicts that didn't happen and you traced back, you'd find a lot of the same things. You'd find the same ancient hatreds, you'd find poverty, you'd find those leaders' foibles, you'd find those assassinations and idiosyncratic events, all right? So these things aren't unimportant, but they're probably not the reason we fight. So why don't we fight? Well, we don't fight because war is so ruinous. And if any of us forgot this in the past year, I think what's been going on in Russia and the Ukraine has reminded us. Ukraine's economy has shrunk by half. Uh, Russia's economy has been set back 25 years to a previous stage of industrialization, right? And that's not American newspapers or propaganda talking. That is actually a quote from the central bank governor of Russia. Okay, and of course, every single person on the planet has felt the pain of this war in higher fuel prices, higher energy prices, higher food prices. And so it's cost, these costs of war that, that drive most adversaries to avoid it. All right, and there's a very simple logic here, right? And it's, 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 it's I could call it game theory, but it's really just basic arithmetic or common sense, right? Every time two adversaries have a possible dispute. Maybe they're fighting over a territory. Maybe they're fighting over a parliament. Maybe they're fighting over an issue. Who controls this? Who controls that? They have a choice. They can either compromise and split whatever they're fighting over in rough proportion to their each other's ability to burn the house down, in rough proportion to their economic and their military might. And in this example, I've shown two uh, to, to roughly evenly matched adversaries. So they can basically split the territory down the middle, or they can flip a coin for that territory, destroy a share of what they're fighting for, and then one of them gets it, or, the, or they get nothing, and the other gets nothing, all right? And so what the costs of war do is they open up this wedge, and it's like a peace bonus. Both sides get to divide it if they can find a peaceful way to split that pie, all right? And so every day... This is with this is the calculus that India and Pakistan faces, except that wedge is enormous. Why? Because the possibility of a nuclear war. All right. And so they have massive incentives for peace. And so the good news is that if you're a peace builder, it's not that wars are natural state and 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 we're you know we're doomed to be a species full of violence. Rather, there are natural incentives. The cost of war that we can harness. So you're not moving against the grain as a peace builder. You're moving with the grain. And you're trying to make those rare instances when adversaries do fight and do use violence go back to the normal state of loathing one another in peace. Okay, and this was even true of Vladimir Putin prior to his invasion of Ukraine for at least two reasons. The first is that he spent 20 years doing everything else possible 
to co-opt the politics of that country without resorting to invasion. He tried poisonings and assassinations, dark money, support for separatists, on and on and on and on and on, all right? And it was only as a last resort after 20 years that he even contemplated invasion. What's more is invasion is never something he's ever needed to contemplate with most of his other neighbors, whom he's more successfully co-opted their politics. Take Belarus as an example, right? They're there. Uh, it, and if this isn't an example where Russia and Belarus are evenly matched, right? This is an example where it doesn't look like our, our pie here on the left. This is where one side maybe has 80 or 90 percent of the military and economic might. And so they demand semi-sovereignty. They demand a sacrifice of independence. And with many of their neighbors, as with most empires, for most of history, they've received it, and they've received it without having to go to war. Okay, the third thing the book is about, of course, is fighting, because I didn't write a book called Why We Don't Fight. I wrote a book called Why We Fight. And, and if you remembered one thing from this presentation, or you remembered one thing from the book, you should remember that the reason we fight, every answer to this question of why we fight is a reason that our leaders or a society ignored the costs of war or were willing to pay them. And the book, or at least the first half of the book, is actually a piece of good news. Even though there's a reason for every war and a war for every reason, there's only so many ways logically we could ignore the costs of war or that our leaders or societies can, can be willing to pay them. And, and, and so all of these millions of reasons kind of boil down to five main logics. And in the book, I use slightly more technical language, but for the purpose of today, we could think of it as being unaccountable when our leaders are unaccountable, when our leaders or our societies are ideological, they're biased, uncertain, or unreliable. Now, what do I mean by these? Well, let me walk you through, and just let me use this contemporary example of, of Russia and Ukraine, and because it's, it's on so many of our minds. And, and the first one is very simple, right? Remember that cost-benefit calculus? Do I split an undamaged pie or, or flip a coin for a damaged one? Well, the costs of war were that wedge that deterred us from fighting. But if I'm an unaccountable leader, and in the extreme, we could think of a personalist dictator, I don't bear many of those costs of war. Do I care about the soldiers dead? Do I care about the suffering of the people? Do I care about this? Do I care about that? Well, actually, maybe a little, right? I worry about the stability of my regime. I worry about lots of things. But I'm insulated from a lot of those costs of war. And so I'm much more ready to use violence than a leader that's checked and accountable. More importantly though, if I think that I have a personal interest, if I think that me or my regime is more likely to survive and flourish because of violence, even if it's against the interests of the wider group, then I have a private incentive to take my country to conflict. And that's one story we hear about Vladimir Putin. He's not only a personalist dictator who was insulated from any costs of war and could ignore them, but to the extent that he saw extinguishing a democratic flame on his doorstep as regime preserving, right, extinguishing a democratic flame amongst the people that Russians identify with maybe more than anybody else on the planet, to the extent that's true, he had a private incentive to quash that, all right, by any means necessary. The second reason is when we're ideological, when we get something intangible, something ethereal, something outside that pie, when war is valuable or the act of fighting is valuable in and of itself. And so it's not so much that we ignore the cost of war, but we're willing to pay some costs to attain this ethereal or ideological goal. All right. And this is also a story we hear about Vladimir Putin, right? Uh, we hear about a leader or a ruling cabal that is obsessed with the idea of national glory, of getting the empire back together, right? You don't, you can believe those stories, you can disbelieve those stories. I personally think they're a little overstated. Nobody knows, nobody has any information, nobody's talking to him, this is a closed circle. So everybody's just guessing. Uh, so you can believe those guesses, but, but or not, but know that this is the kind of argument it is. It's, a, it's saying that actually we think this invasion happened in part because it's still costly to Putin and he's willing to bear some of those costs and risks because he cares about this issue. That's what kind of argument that is. And there's a similar argument, right? One that a lot of us think is more noble that explains why Ukrainians existed, uh, why, why, why resisted. Right, the Belarusians didn't resist. The Kazakhstanis accepted 
the Russian peacekeepers, right? Many of the other neighbors have been cowed, but Ukrainians said no way, right? There was a split of the pie. Russia had 80 or 90% of the military and economic might. You should take semi-sovereignty, right? This is the deal that empires and tyrannical regimes have been given, giving smaller nations throughout history, and most of those nations have taken it. Uh, and sometimes those compromises are repugnant. And so Ukrainians are fighting partly because they're willing to pay the costs because many of them find the idea of this compromise repugnant, all right? So once again, this is an ideological reason for the war. I think it's one of the most understated reasons for this war, right? Which is not to blame the Ukrainians, but it's to recognize that this is the explanation for every freedom fight in history. It could be the Ukrainians, it could be the Mau Mau in Kenya, the Algerians against the French, it could be the American revolutionaries in the 1770s, which is a story I tell in the book. Okay, the third story you hear about why Putin invaded the Ukraine is actually that he's an insulated, isolated leader. As an autocrat, he's expunged any naysayer from his inner circle. Everyone's scared to put bad information up the chain, right? This isn't just a story people tell about Vladimir Putin. This is a story that people tell about the Blair administration or the Bush administration in 2000 and 2001 in the run-up to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, these are stories of, of leaders getting that basic cost-benefit calculus we started with wrong because they're underestimating the costs of war or they're overestimating the costs of victory. I just gave you an institutional story of bias, one that, you know, is really pervasive in autocracies. Personalized dictators like, like Putin are often getting rosy information. It's a real problem for dictators. Okay, but, but there's psychological stories of, of leaders being biased as well. All of those stories have the same flavor of getting that cost-benefit calculus wrong, right? You can believe it, you don't have to believe it, but that's the kind of story it is. The problem with these stories, again, I think it's probably true in the case of Russia. I think it overstates the importance of bias and it tends to understate the importance of the fourth kind of logic I talk about in the book, which is just the sheer uncertainty of the situation, right? You can't be biased in a completely certain world, right? There's a lot less room for that, right? One side doesn't know the strength and resolve of the other. There's a, there isn't just a fog of war, there's a fog in, in the threat of war. And that makes war a gamble, okay? And so if you think back just 10 months ago to how uncertain was Russia's military strength, Ukrainian puckiness and resolve, or Western unity on sanctions, the idea that Russia would get a bad draw on all three was within the realm of possibility, but nobody predicted it, no one. And so amidst this uncertainty, it's possible, not that Vladimir Putin got things wrong, but that it was a gamble and he got unlucky, right? And it's entirely possible that if we were to rerun history a hundred times or a thousand times and look at the events of the past year again and again and again, in some number of those events, maybe he takes Kiev in the first two weeks. Maybe, maybe they capture President Zelensky, maybe Zelensky gets on the plane, right? So we don't even know ex post if Putin was was wrong in his gamble, right? We can disagree with the morality, his reasons, all these things, but it's it's not a hundred percent clear that he was biased. Rather, he was operating in an environment of uncertainty, like most leaders. And anyone, and so far I've just been telling you a story of of uncertainty as noise, but there's a, a real strategic dilemma here, right? And that prevents adversaries from resolving uncertainty and anyone who's ever played a game of poker intuitively understands the game theory which is that when you're in this situation in principle you should both want to sort of say look war is costly i promise you i'm strong but you can never believe your opponent right because you're worried they're bluffing and if you've ever played a game of poker you know that your optimal strategy when your when your hand is concealed is not to bluff none of the time you also know your optimal strategy is not to bluff all the time your, your, strategy, your best strategy is to bluff some of the time. Uh, and likewise, if you're facing someone who's bluffing, you know that your optimal strategy is not to fold all of the time. You also know that your optimal strategy is not to call or invade all of the time. It's to invade some of the time. Amidst this uncertainty, invading sometimes, somewhat unpredictably, is a optimal strategy. All right? And so this is the cold calculated strategic story 
of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is not one we hear. We hear one of a personalized dictator who's ideological and biased, but we don't so much consider uh, the, the structure of the situation or some of the strategic incentives. And that's a problem because we don't want to get our adversaries wrong. The last is also a strategic story. It's one when we think our opponent's unreliable, not because we think they're untrustworthy, we doubt their character. It's because we think they face incentives to renege on a deal. This is a story that's used to explain World War I, the US invasion of Iraq. It's a story often of one where you expect your adversary to be much more powerful in future. And so they can use that power in future to take advantage of you today sorry, to take advantage of you in the future. And so your deal today is incredible because you know about their incentives in future. All right, and so you launch what's called a preventative war to lock in your advantage now, all right? This is what's known in political economy as a commitment problem, all right? And it's maybe one of the most important causes of, of wars in history. Interestingly, it's probably not a big explanation for this war. We don't need all five to understand Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think the first four get us most of the way. I think this now or never lock in our advantage argument, though, does help us understand a little bit of the timing of this war. You can make an argument that at the outset of this year, Russia was at its peak leverage vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and it was just downhill from there. Russia's economy was stagnating. Ukraine had nowhere to go but up. It was getting closer to EU. And most importantly, it was acquiring a lot of defensive weaponry, such as drones from Turkey and uh, uh, building its own missiles, like these Neptune missiles we've seen in action in the Black Sea sinking ships, all right? And so arguably Russia had its best chances. And so there was this sort of now or never logic, uh, but but probably we don't need all five to explain, to explain every war. The fourth thing I wanna talk about is that I've been talking in terms of great power politics, India versus Pakistan and, and Russia invading Ukraine and so forth. That's not the level I operate on. I've spent most of my career working on civil wars in, in East Africa, on ethnic and religious violence in West Africa, on gang violence in uh, Colombia and, and, and Mexico and here in Chicago. And what's really important is all of these sort of five logics sort of have a certain universality, right? All of these types of violence are super different, right? And as a scholar, your job is to sort of pick one of them and just dive in and understand what's special. Okay, and that's great, but every so often we have to step back and sort of say, actually, what do these kinds of really distinct kinds of violence have in common? And, and so to illustrate, let me talk about some of my work in Chicago, where for the last five years, I've been working to help design and evaluate one of the city's biggest responses to the massive spike in homicides that the city has experienced, right? Homicides that are for the most part targeted assassinations between members of small groups, groups they don't necessarily call themselves gangs. Gangs implies a level of structure, hierarchy, and organization that really only existed in the past. These are more small, uh, less formal organizations that call themselves crews, mobs, and cliques. But they're targeted assassinations between members and leaders of these groups. So what's going on? Well, you'll hear three kinds of stories and they're both sorry. Actually, you'll hear two kinds of stories, but there's three stories if you listen carefully. The story you'll hear most commonly in the newspapers is about young men who are getting emotional, hot reactive emotional responses to perceived slights and a ready availability of guns, right? But it's not so much the guns, it's, the, it's, this, it's this hot emotional reaction that's driving some of these shootings. Definitely true. And the program we've been working on is really designed to tackle that. The second story you'll hear is a story of vengeance. That one of these, a lot of these crews might form around the killing of a brother, an uncle, or a father. And they'll seek vengeance, right? This is a story, but they're not mistaken. They don't regret this the day after. It's not hot, reactive, and emotional. There's This is like a cold case of revenge, and they're satisfied. They're getting something that nothing else except violence can seemingly deliver to them uh, in this blood feud. And then the third story you don't hear, unless you talk to some of these guys, is you know, nicely illustrated by you know, one of the guys in this our program who led one of these crews, and he talked about how he became a killer. And he said, look, when we started out selling drugs, somebody robbed us. And you know, we realized that they were going to keep coming and robbing us again and again. We were going to get killed or we we're going to have to get out of the game. Uh, or we were going to have to show them we couldn't be messed with. And so 
we got together and we hunted them down and we killed them. And we had to do that a few more times. And after that, uh, for the most part, nobody messed with us. Sometimes we'd have to, you know, top it up a little bit, but, but we had to establish a reputation. All right. And why does somebody need a reputation? Well, you only need a reputation in a world of uncertainty because of his like resolve and his strength had been written on his forehead. They never would have robbed him in the first place. What I've just told you is a story of three roots of violence. One of them is a story of, of, of violence delivering something that was valued, right? This vengeance, revenge, uh, and, and thus there are war is costly, but they're willing to pay some of those costs for this good. I told you a story of bias. It was a much more psychological story of bias, but it was one of acting rashly and underestimating the enemy. But I also told you a story of uncertainty right it's as if you're playing that poker game and you're deciding to bluff or not or to fold or call or not and everybody you're ever going to play poker with again is standing around watching and judging how they're going to play against you based on how you play this game and that might be give you an added incentive to call or invade in order to establish a reputation and thus protect yourself in the future it's you might not uh, agree with that strategic logic you might find it morally reprehensible but but you need to understand it and when I said I use these explanations to understand violence at every level, I actually use these same three explanations to explain the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, not just why the United States went in, but why the United States stayed so long, right? Yes, there was bias. I've already talked about some of the intelligence failures and misperceptions and probably emotional reactions that propelled the country partly into war. And certainly there was an element of vengeance. And we can imagine a world where bin Laden is caught in 2004 instead of almost 15 years later. And maybe that war ends more quickly, right? But fundamentally, I think this is a story of reputation, right? A country that most people in the world thought would not put boots on the ground, right? They pulled out of Somalia after Black Hawk Down and a handful of American deaths. They refused to go into Rwanda, and they were essentially dragged kicking and streaming into the Balkans as, as part of a peacekeeping and state-building state operation in the mid to late 90s, only because this was Europe, and only because American uh, young men were not being put in harm's way, okay? And so that's a reputation where maybe uh, a group can attack the United States with impunity. And so every time a president or a general or a politician said, you know, what will, they didn't think whether they were deciding whether to invade or whether to leave, right? Every time they did, th they didn't really care. Well, they cared what the Taliban thought, right? But they, the, the Taliban was not the main audience. Every time someone said, well, if we leave or if we fail to go in, what will fill in the blank think? Fill in the blank could be another terror group. It could be ISIS. It could be uh, China, North Korea, Russia, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and on and on and on and on. Every time they thought, if we leave now, what will so-and-so think? That was a story of us trying to establish reputation as a country, okay? And so, again, you might not agree, you might not find that strategic uh, uh, incentive to invade and keep going, especially when things get tough. You may not you know, find that you may find that morally reprehensible, but I want you to uh, understand it. Okay, finally, uh, the final message of the book, and really the last half, is that if there are five ways that we ignore the costs of war or are willing to pay them, every path to peace tackles the five. Okay, there's a lot of stuff we do that we call peace building that doesn't, uh, that I think is maybe important for itself poverty alleviation, climate change addressing climate change, right? Important objectives in and of themselves. And in the book, I talk about why actually it's not really clear that any of these things is a cause of conflict, despite what you will hear, all right? And the evidence mostly supports that, right? So let's eliminate world poverty. Let's stop climate change for intrinsic reasons. We're probably not going to make it a more peaceful world, right? That would be great. Probably not true. Rather, we need to focus on what the actual causes of war are, and we need to think about what kinds of societal institutions and what kinds of interventions actually address the five. In the book, I talk about uh, 
I talk about the ways in which we can make our societies more interdependent, how economic interdependence, social interdependence, including immigration, including more uh, exchange and ideological interdependence has made the world a much more peaceful place. Uh, and the evidence for that. I talk about the state. I talk about policing. I talk about the ways in which effective uh, creation of rules and enforcement of rules has also been pacifying in most places for most of history. All right. I talk about checks and balances on power and how not just democracy, but actually just the kinds of division and separation of powers, the ones that someone like Vladimir Putin has managed to sort of basically rid his country of. These checks and balances of power are incredibly pacifying, not only because they make our, account our leaders more accountable, but, but because they make us less vulnerable to their idiosyncratic ideologies, their bias, the uncertainty that comes with having to think about the single mind of a maybe unpredictable individual, and the fact that individuals, dictators are unreliable. They're, 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 it's impossible for them to make credible commitments. And so checks and balances are the path to peace. Uh, I could talk about all of those, but we need a lot more than the 40 minutes I have. So I just want to talk about interventions, the tool, the toolkit we have and which ones are effective and why. And in the book, I talk about sanctions, I talk about peacekeeping, and I talk about why a lot of people underestimate them. They're a lot more effective than people think. Uh, for an example, I just want to talk about mediation. All right. And when we think about international mediators, right, you often think about big politicians uh, going and trying to settle disputes between nations, right? And that's important. So right now, Turkey and Israel are playing this very delicate and important role uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They're not taking sides. They're trying to be impartial mediators. A lot of pressure on them not to do that. Uh, is that wise? Well, a lot depends on whether or not we think mediation matters. And this is hard to know, right? It seems like a lot of grandstanding. What, what, what can these people do, really? Um, and actually, the answer we get is that what, what, when we actually look at what mediators do, number one, they're trying to reduce uncertainty, right? They're trying to, they're basically looking at the hand of one side, looking at the hand of the other, and staking their reputation on being able to communicate accurately what the strength and resolve is of both sides. And that's why it's so useful to have these people who have been mediators again and again and again and again, because you know they value their reputation and they built that reputation. And so you can trust them to some degree. They're trying to solve these commitment problems and this problem of unreliability by finding ingenious ways to structure peace accords that each side thinks is incentive compatible for the other. They're trying to reduce the bias, the psychological bias and the institutional bias of both sides and to make them act like the rational bargainers of that really simple model we started out with. And they're trying to make unaccountable leaders more accountable, not necessarily these top leaders, right? So I'm looking at, at Israel and Palestine here. They're actually, the unaccountable people they're worried about are one or two rungs down. They're the spoilers and the splinter groups who out of their own personal material or ideological interests want to break the peace down want to shoot that soldier or fire that missile, whatever it does to sort of pull these, pull these, pull these talks apart. All right. And so helping coalitions cohere and 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 actually forcing helping these leaders get their people in line, all right, and stop these sort of unaccountable splinter groups is a really, really important role of mediation. And the kinds of force like peacekeepers and sanctions and things that mediators can also uh, cooperate to help bring. Okay, we don't have a lot of great evidence on this, all right? If we had more time, I could talk about how, in some of my own research, I've been trying to test how mediators at a much lower level of conflict, whether it's ethnic and religious conflicts, are actually really effective at bringing peace. Um, but what I'd rather tell you about is, is my own experience in with a different kind of mediator and a different kind of peacemaker in Medellin, Colombia. And this story begins in prison, which is where for the last six years, we've been interviewing a lot of these middle and high ranking uh, gang and mafia leaders. All right, the, the leaders of, of what, what basically 400 really, really well organized, profitable drug selling gangs called Combos in this, in this, in this you know, city of Medellin. Uh, and one of them was telling us about a fight that broke out over a game of billiards and he doesn't remember why the fight broke out you know maybe insult or petty cheating or but he does remember that one side pulled out their guns and and shot at the other and why 
uh, why why they were carrying guns in prison is just a whole other talk. You'll have to invite me back for that next year. The but when the dust settled, twenty three people were injured. Amazingly, no one was killed. All right. But as you can imagine, there was a series of, series of reprisal killings back and forth within the prison out of out of emotion and revenge and maybe strategy. And because the majority of these gangs' territories were on the outside, those reprisal killings spilled out onto the street. And every gang in the city lined up behind one side or the other, and they prepared for war. And Medellin, when it has gone to war, has become the most violent place on the planet, probably five times more violent than the most violent international war, civil war in the world today, uh, five times more violent than, than Russia's invasion of Ukraine, all right? Um, but that's not what happened. There never was a billiards war. Right? And there's a few reasons for that. One is that the combos actually don't like to fight. No one wants to get killed. And nobody makes money from drug selling in the middle of a gunfight. But the other thing that happened is a group of shadowy figures stepped in. A, a members and leaders of about 15 to 17 mafia-like organizations, called sometimes called Razones. And the Razones sort of addressed some of these issues between the combos, right? To the extent that there was uncertainty, they have something they call La Mesa. Uh, they sat the combos down. Uh, and to the extent that there are commitment problems and unreliability, well, they have ways of solving that. In fact, instead of having 200, sorry, 400 fractious combos fighting over territory and valuable drug corners, the city is actually a set of 15 confederations of contiguous combos, each one headed by one of these razones. All right, and the razones keep the peace within their territory by, by providing la mesa, the table, by enforcing commitment between the, the combos that are uh, subordinate to them. And if combo leaders are unaccountable, vengeant, or emotional, or otherwise biased, they'll provide them a whole bunch of incentives, monetary or violent, sometimes at the point of a gun. In order to keep the peace, and in order to, and when a combo has a dispute with a combo with in beneath another razón, well, they have a whole other set of institutions that they sometimes call la oficina or the office, in order to help mediate between razones and their competing combos. And in this way, Medellín has actually become one of the most peaceful cities in the Americas in the last ten years. It has a homicide rate that's maybe a third or quarter what's happening in a lot of large American cities right now, including Chicago. Okay, now this is not the system of peace that Medellin wants, right? It's not equal, it's not just, it's not legal, it's not, you know, it's none of these good things, right? But nonetheless, it works, and it works to some degree because it is addressing the five roots of conflict. I like to talk about Medellin because I think it's actually a really nice analogy for our world. Right, We have not a world of 200 fractious nations fighting over one another. We have a bunch of frasones, right? We have a bunch of powerful hegemons, the United States, you know, France, Germany, Britain, Russia, China. And they sort of mind their business and the business of their neighborhood. And they keep, they, 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 they help keep and they help facilitate peace amongst the nations or the combos in their, in their respective sphere of influence, all right? And they create a set of institutions like the UN Security Council in order to, to actually mediate some of these disputes between these competing countries and combos and between themselves. All right. And it's not equal, it's not democratic, it's not always just, it's imperfectly implied. And just like in Medellin, it doesn't always work. Medellin has plunged into war two or three times in the last few decades, typically when one of the big Crossones decides that it wants to make a move. Likewise, the UN Security Council and a lot of our institutions are paralyzed when one of the big Crossones, right, sometimes it's the United States, sometimes it's Russia, maybe soon it'll be China, decides that they want to make war. All right, so, so we deserve, we need to construct better institutions, but we've made a lot of progress. Okay, uh, I would love to keep talking to you about these, but what I would rather do is take your questions. And so I will I will stop it here uh, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Chris. That was a super interesting presentation. I uh, really enjoyed it. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions here. And so the, you won't be able to hear the people that ask the questions. So I'll just repeat them. Uh, but I, I have a, just one quick question for you first. <laughs> and so 
It's very interesting your your research in the Chicago, the violence in Chicago. So, so do you have any suggestions for? I mean, mm -hmm. are are you suggesting something like Medellin, uh, you know, setting something up like that <laughs> among the different gang or not gangs, right? Or groups in well, Chicago. Well, yeah, no, I, I I don't I don't know that I want to export Medellin solution. Although you know it is at work um, in two ways. Uh, so one is that about there's a great job there's a great book called the insane chicago way by a guy named john hagedorn and it's actually about uh it's a similar story about the latino gangs in in uh in medellin and about how the the italian mafia uh actually were trying to tutor them saying like guys like get it together uh you guys are losing money all this fighting you need to organize yourselves um and so they did it's uh, the book is about their attempt to form this association like la oficina and and the name for it is i love it it's they called it sgd spanish growth and development um and and it failed but actually the latino gangs more than other gangs in the city did succeed at some degree of institution building um and it's i think it's one of the reasons why violence is lower probably i i this is a hypothesis but i think there's a good argument that it's one reason that violence is a little bit lower in the latino communities and our most violent communities in chicago right now are not because they are managing that themselves also the state did not undermine them quite so strongly um for better for worse you know for good reasons uh the u.s government and and the federal government in particular has just had a, a policy of cutting off the heads of every organized criminal organization, especially black gangs in Chicago. And so anybody in the last 20 years who puts up their head as a potential leader gets a cut off, they're put in a supermax prison or, or something. And, and so that's why we don't have these organized gangs of yesteryear. We have these fractious crews. Nobody's organizing them. There's no leaders, right? And that's been really effective at deorganizing crime, at not having powerful corazones and super gangs like Medellin does. And but it comes at the cost of um, not having the kinds of leaders who can actually quell some of the violence. And and I do think that's part of the story of what's going on in the city today. It's that it's very hard to control. It's hard to control the violence amongst a set of leaderless factions in that traditional way. And so we need new tools. And that's kind of one of the things we're trying to develop and test right now. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you. So uh, the question is, you've mentioned trying to control these. Is there a way to use these principles to eliminate gangs? Is that the question? Is that right? Okay. So um, I think, I mean, I think it's a lot easier to reduce violence than it is to reduce these groups. Um, so, so look, uh, you take a city like Chicago, we could be talking about Medellin. Um, you know, most all right, most people are not members of gangs in these neighborhoods, right? But even most members of gangs aren't shooting. Uh, and, and a lot of the gangs don't really have a lot of interest in shooting. You know, they don't, nobody likes living this life, like looking over your shoulder all the time, constantly on the alert. Um, and so, so really, you know, we had less than, I think, 3,000 shootings last year. That's a lot. Um, fewer than a thousand homicides that's a lot but that means this is a this is a problem with a couple thousand people not with the thousands and thousands of members of gangs or the thousands and thousands of hangers on or the tens and thousands or hundreds of thousands of young men in those neighborhoods it's a very small targeted problem with a very small number of people and so we need very targeted solutions um and and we need ones that are addressing vengeance emotional slights and the strategic dimension um, and to one of the strategies that does that very well, you know, we've seen with our program, we've seen a 60% reduction in homicide arrests among the young men who are going through this program, uh, is actually trying to resolve that emotional, um, uh, uh, hot reactiveness and also trying to find alternative ways to address vengeance. And so it's a program of a mix of cognitive behavioral therapy and skills for also building, uh, finding alternative ways to settle disputes. And it's an 18 month program targeted at the most violent young men in the city. And about most of them take it up when offered. 
Uh, and then most of them stick with it, and we see this pretty dramatic effect, right? So it's not solving all the violence in the city. It's not addressing the strategic roots. We could talk about other interventions that do that. Um, but it is having a big impact. Uh, so the question is about the the missile that uh, landed in Poland, and originally it was blamed on Russia. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. and there was a, an immediate panic and and call from some people for boots on the ground, and just uh, the the question is just basically what you think of that situation, how people reacted to it. Right. I mean, it's a good example of how uncertainty can. Un, in, can can actually make adversaries go to war even when they don't want to, right? And so, you know, another great example that is very similar to this is cyber attacks, right? Because most missiles come with a return address. This one didn't. Well, it probably did. We'll find out. You know, the next weeks will probably tell where this missile came from. But a lot of cyber attacks do not. Or if they do, you don't trust that return address, right? You think, oh, well, it looks like it came from China, but maybe there's some things that maybe it was North Korea, maybe it was the Iranian National Guard. And in this situation, just like this poker analogy, your optimal strategy is not to just do nothing. And your optimal strategy is not to attack all of them in return. It's to actually make your best guess and attack some of the time, basically to preserve that reputation. And so these sort of low cost, and hard to trace kinds of attacks can be really destabilizing because they increase rather than decrease the amount of uncertainty and thus create these really complicated strategic dynamics that could push two enemies that would rather loathe than peace into violence. Okay, so I'll try to <laughs> correct, correct me if I get or make sure I get this right. Okay, so the, the question is about oftentimes when the peace process is being negotiated by international institutions that mm -hmm. they will essentially um, impose something on the losing side saying that you know, you lost, you have to give something up and uh, essentially, so, I mean, does that capture it? And so, so, yeah, we see that with Ukraine today. So, so what, what do you, uh, what do you suggest? Uh, what do you think about that whole process and that the losing? Yeah. Has to well, I mean, there aren't that many examples of, there, there are many examples of peace being imposed from the outside. I'd say that's it's often often these outside parties have less influence than maybe we think. Uh, it depends on the size of the conflict, right? You know, it, I worked in Liberia where outside agencies had a lot of influence, but that's one of the smallest, weakest countries in the world. Um, listen, the the definition of almost any peaceful compromise is both sides don't like it. Uh, they, they both have to make painful sacrifices. Um, as humans, we're really good at seeing the sacrifices that the side we're most sympathetic to or that the side that we're a member of. We, we pay more attention to those and we, we don't tend to see or empathize with some of the, the, the sacrifices that others make. So, so we have to be careful with that. Um, but, but, you know, I think he's right, the, or she's right, who's ever asking this question, that, that, that Ukraine is being asked to make some painful sacrifices by some in the international community. And for the most part, they're saying no. 
we we refuse and uh and and that's that's their i suppose that's their prerogative Okay, so the question is, uh, these principles, they will uh, stop the, the violence, uh, but then will, can they resolve the underlying issues as well yeah. that, that maybe are the roots of the violence? I know that's a great point. I mean, in, in, uh, in peace building circles, they talk about the difference between negative and positive peace. Negative peace is just not shooting one another and, and a kind of brinksmanship, right? Which is miserable. We'd like there to be like a lot more padding and and what what that's that's what's like there's a positive piece the things i talked about at, at, at briefly what i said the second half the second half of the book is about building more interdependent societies about political checks and balances about stronger systems of rules and enforcement like the state those are actually the classic kinds of padding that i think do sort of get us back from this brinksmanship um, and so, and so, yeah, a lot of the book is, is about that. I think I, I probably just wasn't able to do it justice in a short talk. Thanks. Okay, so the question is about the U.S. maybe getting involved in a conflict that involves two other countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so what are the benefits and costs of getting involved in those type of conflicts as a third party? Yeah, I mean, the one on my mind right now is Taiwan and China. Um, it's interesting how, how little any U.S. administration any of the past three or four administrations have actually articulated a really clear strategic rationale for inter for basically getting involved. Uh, I think they exist, but the fact that that's not really uh, a clear and open policy is kind of strange and a little bit disturbing to me. I think it's a little bit dangerous. Um, I think they leave it ambiguous, and and they maybe there's a reason for that. I think it's obviously tremendously costly for everybody, right? To sort of, it's gonna escalate and extend a war without doubt if if the US were to get involved. Um, what's the argument for it being worth it from an American point of view? Or what's the explanation from a more dispassionate point of view? Why could the five reasons break down and the United States decide to enter a war? Well, there would be an element of reputation building, right? To sort of say there are certain red lines uh, that, that that we don't think should be crossed and just as maybe we want to arm ukraine in order to basically give uh give nations no the fewer future dictators less incentive to uh violate international law invade other nations it might make sense to actually draw a red line and, and mean it um secondly they might do it because uh one side particularly the more autocratic side so i'm very worried about the personalization of power in china because i think it does increase the chances of war of one side drawing the united states in because at least one side's ignoring the costs and doing doing things that crossing a, a red line that the rest of the world might not accept um uh but um you know my hope and i think you've seen that this week and what's going on in bali is both sides basically trying to calm those flames and maintain interdependent economies and interdependent societies and conversations in order to hopefully just loathe one another in peace uh and so that's anyways that's my that's my hope So uh, a compliment that he really uh, 
enjoyed your presentation, respects what you're doing and uh, appreciates it. And he's wondering um, if there is an application in business on how various companies compete. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and perhaps there are also some questions online in the Q&A. So perhaps I'll address one of those after this, if that's okay. Um, yeah, you know, actually, it's funny. A lot of the theory and a lot of the game theory, especially that underlies what uh, I talked about today came from law and business. So most of the time we don't go to court, right? Because court's too costly, so we settle out of court. A lot of, a lot of what I've talked about emerged from legal theory uh, and how we go to court because we're either unaccountable and insulated or maybe lawyers or somebody has an incentive to go to court because of these uncertainty dynamics, because of commitment problems, right? And courts are, and our whole legal system is sometimes designed to counter those things and make us find ways to resolve conflicts outside of it. Likewise, labor strikes. Right. Most of the time, employers and, and like unions and, and, and management don't, you know, move to a strike. They find an agreement or if they do go to strike, they're over pretty quickly. Right. A lot of our theory and evidence comes from this. And when do they go? Well, when there's commitment problems, when there's tremendous uncertainty about the resolve of each side, when one side has a private incentive to to seek a union battle, maybe because it establishes a reputation on and on and on. So so there's actually a lot of applicability. Um, and and so we have a we, we stand a lot to to learn. Should I should I tackle one of these online questions for the online attendees? Yeah, yes. Could you? I can't see the question. Yeah, I can. I can read it out. So one of them one of them basically says, "What's going to bring peace in this invasion of of Russia and Ukraine? Um, will there be a Minsk three, and or will there be a failure?" Um, I'm I'm pessimistic actually about this. I think it will take a while for peace now. I've been wrong on this again and again, and just about everybody's been wrong about it in this. So nobody, sh everyone should just, it's really hard to predict. But the forces at work that make me a little bit pessimistic about a quick resolution is just how long, very often, like those first months of fighting resolve most of the uncertainty and most of the bias, and that war ends. So most wars in history have been less than three months. We're now in the, up in the 90th, 95th percentile in terms of length of wars. This one is way up there. And, and there's some dynamics that make it very difficult. One of them is just the persistent uncertainty, right? Is like, what's this mobilization going to do for Russia? You know, what kinds of stores uh, and stock resolve do Ukrainians still have? How West, how, 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 how resolved will the West be through a cold winter? These are still a tremendous amount of uncertainty yet to be resolved. That's kind of amazing. But there's also a commitment problem on both sides, but I don't think it's this classic commitment problem or strategic one. I think it's an ideological one. I think there's been, as with many long wars, there's a hardening of positions. On the one hand, Ukrainians are just seem unwilling to accept anything short of full Russia, uh, uh, at least a retreat to these to these 2014 or 2000, maybe even just the 2021 borders, but 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 a full Russian withdrawal. And, and Putin, meanwhile, has staked his regime, essentially, it, so it seems, on something, all right? So it's very hard to see either side uh, actually being able to make concessions and, and survive in power. And so that is, uh, that actually makes me think this is going to drag on for at least another year, if not more. Well, so, so on that, uh... Not so positive note. <laughs> um, the, the, we're, we're unfortunately out of time, but uh, we've had a we have a big audience here that you can't see, and uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. And so let's everyone give one more round of applause for Chris. No, thank you so much. I wish I could have been there in person. Thanks again. We're looking forward to seeing you in person next year. So thank Great. you. Great. Me too.